Amen. All right, so Romans 15 is where we will be today, verses 1 through 13. And we are continuing a conversation, really, that we started last week. So this is kind of part two to a two-parter where Paul is encouraging the church in Rome to live in such a way with one another, to live in such a way where you don't fight for your own rights, but instead you serve the people that you're in relationship with. Uh, Last week, we looked at how you uh, relate to people that you have a difference of opinion with. You maybe remember these three different levels that we talked about, levels of importance in the church for issues in the church, right? There are levels of primary importance. Those are essential for salvation. The gospel, uh, who God is, who Jesus is, things like that, things that we would never compromise on, things that if we disagree with others about those things, it's worth separating over. Uh, We talked about things that are secondary issues, right? Not of not essential for salvation. They're very important, but maybe they, they aren't enough to separate us as brothers and sisters, but maybe we would choose to worship in different places. So mode of baptism or, or different ways that churches organize themselves or do things, right? But then there are these issues of preference, these issues of opinion. They're debatable, right? We can have conversations about them, uh, but Paul in chapter 14 is saying to the people, don't ever let that come to a place where you're arguing over these things. Don't argue over opinions. Don't don't treat these things as if they are hills to die on. Instead, recognize what it looks like to live with other people. For those of you who have a, a conscience issue about this thing, that's okay, but don't impose your conscience on the people around you. But for those who feel a freedom in your conscience, recognize that the way that you live out your freedom, that impacts the people around you. And so Paul was giving really just a picture of what it looks like to have these interpersonal relationships in the life of the church. Well, today he's going to continue that conversation, but he's he's really going to point to the big deal about it all, that ultimately what's happening is we are showing the world the glory of God and the beauty of life in his kingdom when we relate to each other the way that God's word calls us to relate to one another. When we are unified, not uniform, but unified as the people of God. You've heard this saying before probably uh, by a guy named Rupertus Meldenius. It sounds like a made up name and it probably is. Many think it was a pseudonym for Richard Baxter, the Puritan preacher, but he said this, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. That's what we want, right? We want to be unified on the things that are non-negotiable. We want to have liberty to live out uh, what our conscience leads us to. But ultimately, whether we agree with one another or not, we want to be charitable to one another. We want to be gracious to one another. We want to show the people in our life Jesus in the way that Jesus has treated us. Uh, We want to care for people in that way. And all of that is because we actually think this is the heart of God. So if you remember, uh, just before Jesus was arrested, just before Jesus died, he had the opportunity to spend an evening around a table with his friends, his disciples. And Jesus knew that he was about to die. And you can imagine that if you knew you had 24 hours to live, you're about to be turned over and, and put to death, you would say the things that were of utmost importance to you, right? You would communicate to your loved ones and your friends the things that you want them to remember. And what's amazing about Jesus' upper room discourse that we read in the Gospel of John, you may remember we did a series on this called So the World May Know. What's interesting is one of the primary things that Jesus wants to get across on that night when he knows he's about to die is that his heart for his people is that they would be unified, that they would be one. Look at John 17, 22 through 23. You see it on your screen. It says, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. So this is Jesus. He's praying to the Father for his friends, his disciples, and for those that would come after them, for us. He says, he says the glory that you've given me, I've given to them that they may be one even as we are one. So Jesus points to the Godhead, to the unity in the Trinity, and he says, this is what we look like. We are unified, and just like we're unified, God, would you unify them? He says, I and them and you and me. He points to their union in Christ, right? When we have trusted in Jesus, we are brought into union with him. He's in us, we are in him. He says that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know, right? So there's the reason, that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. 
So when Paul is talking to the church in Rome about being unified, he's not just throwing out a preference of his own. He's not saying, hey, I would love it if you guys could get along. No, he's saying this is central to the gospel. It's central to the heart of God, that God's people would be one because that is what the world needs to see. Today, we'll see in the text in Romans 15, he'll talk about the harmony of the people of God and he'll talk about the hope of the people of God. In fact, he'll voice two prayers over the church in Rome. One prayer about the harmony that they're called to live in and one prayer about the hope that they share as the people of God. What I want you to see is this. If you walk away with anything, walk away with this. That the harmony we live in and the hope that we share in show the world the glory of God and the beauty of life in his kingdom. The, the thing that God has done in our life as the, as the sons and daughters of God, if you've trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Here's what's true about you. He's called you into harmonious living with your family, the brothers and sisters of God, or the sons and daughters of God, your brothers and sisters in Christ. And he's also given you a hope. But those things aren't just so that you'll experience life in a better way. That's part of it, but that's not the end game. The end game is that God ultimately would be glorified as his people put on display what his kingdom looks like the beauty and the joy and the peace of living in his kingdom as a son or a daughter of God. Elsewhere in the New Testament, Paul said in Philippians, Philippians chapter two, he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing, right? There's that third level of importance, right? Debatable things. Do everything without grumbling. Don't be like the people of God in the wilderness as they grumbled. And don't dispute with one another that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Then he says this, among whom you shine as lights in the world. That's what God's after, right? That his sons and daughters would shine as lights in the world. Um, I want to do something now. I want to talk a little bit about culture. I promise we're going to get to Romans 15, but I want to do all this in preparation of that. So you may have seen this last week in the news that finally we were able to get a speaker of the house, right? That Congress was finally able to vote on an individual named Mike Johnson. Well, if you're anything like me, you watched over the last couple of weeks as uh, really both Republicans and Democrats acted at times like fools. And I recognize in saying this, that I'm saying things that may step on your toes. I know this because I had conversations after the first service with individuals and that's okay. But what I want to pull out is regardless of who you are, regardless of how you vote, we have Republicans, we have Democrats, we have independents in this place. Hopefully we can all agree that it was a really unfortunate sequence of events. Certainly God worked his plan and, and God's over all things, but certainly we didn't look our best, not only to ourselves, but to the world around us. One media outlet says this, the second longest stretch in American history during which the House of Representatives has gone without a speaker is finally over. But while the speaker race has ended, the ill will caused by deep divisions may not be over yet. It's not hard to understand why after three weeks of futility, Republicans closed ranks around Representative Mike Johnson from Louisiana as the next speaker of the House. The civil war within the Republican Party broke out with four major issues on the table. The looming deadline to fund the government, the war in Ukraine, the crisis at the border, and most recently, the war in Gaza. Any one of those things would have highlighted the importance of a functioning Congress. The combination, though, made the dysfunction in the Republican Party. Now, there are some of you sitting there saying, but what about the Democrats? It applies to everybody, okay? So this isn't one is bad, one is great. There was dysfunction all over the board, and it made that dysfunction all the more perilous. Even the Republicans were saying, quote, this makes us look like a bunch of idiots. Now, as someone who was watching and someone who cares, I I agree, right? It, It made America, in many ways, look like bumbling idiots, Right? The, the world needed us. The world was counting on us, yet we couldn't agree with one another. Another news outlet says this, the chaos has produced mistrust and fresh grudges all over the House GOP. 
which some fear will further complicate the narrow majority's task of governing once it elects a new speaker. Uh, We're not getting the Israel stuff done, said Representative Don Bacon, a Republican from Nebraska. He says, we're not getting the appropriations bills done. We need to move forward. Bacon, who represents a swing district based in Omaha, said, quote, and I think in honor of Taylor Swift, said, there's bad blood, right? And so we recognize that when we look at what's going on in Congress, that's just a picture, it's just a microcosm of what a lack of unity feels like and looks like, right? And how much worse is it when the church looks like this? How much worse is it when people who should have the same value systems, people who should see the world the same way, how horrible is it when we still can't get along, when we still can't come to a place of agreement, when we still can't choose to serve one another out of a a, a desire to build up the other one, right? And so just as the world was impacted negatively by our inability to get our our home in alignment, right, in the, in the Congress, just in the same way the world is impacted, but so much worse when the people of God look like the world around us. So it's with that that I jump into Romans chapter 15, and I want you to kind of keep that visual in front of yourself throughout the rest of this time. He says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. Remember last week, it's talking about those who are strong, those are those who have a conscience maybe that's not easily offended by certain things. Those who are weak are those who have a conscience that that is easily offended. And you would think that Paul would say to the weak, come on, get it together, be okay, recognize you're free in Christ Jesus. But he doesn't, instead he looks to the strong. And he says, hey, you have a responsibility, you have an obligation, a debt, and it's to bear with the failings of the weak not to please yourself, not to satisfy yourself. Verse two, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, right? Look to your neighbor and satisfy your neighbor. Ultimately, he says to build him up. For Christ did not please himself. So Paul looks to the pattern of Christ. It's kind of cool what we'll see here is you see the pattern of Christ. We'll also see the pardon of Christ that we've all experienced. And ultimately, we'll see the power of Christ in the Holy Spirit. I'll kind of point it out as we see it. He says, the pattern of Christ. Christ didn't please himself. For as it is written, he quotes Psalm 69, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. Paul says, hey, listen, the word that we have, it's not just a book. It's there for our instruction. It shows us how we should live in the here and now. He says that through endurance perseverance, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, the comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. You've heard us say in here before that hope, it's not wishful thinking, it's not whistling in the dark, it's not, well, maybe God will come through. No, hope is a confident expectation, a confident expectation that God who said that he would do certain things will most assuredly do those things, that we can take that to the bank. And Paul says, I want you to have that confident expectation. I want you to have that hope. And that comes through the endurance and encouragement of the scriptures. So he voices this prayer, this first prayer over them. So may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, one of the things we're talking about today is that the harmony we live in glorifies God to a watching world. He says that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. We have the pattern of Jesus. Now, this is the pardon of Jesus. Just like Jesus welcomed you, he accepted you, he pardoned you, he forgave you of your sins. And in the same way, Paul says, treat others like that. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Why? For the glory of God, for the praise and exaltation of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised, to the Jews, to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. 
Look at what Paul is doing here. He's saying, hey, listen, from the very beginning, God's plan was to bring together those who had the promises, the Jews, and those who were outside of the promises, the Gentiles. That from day one, God's plan was to take people who should not sit at the same table and to bring them together to sit at the same table, to live in harmony with one another. And what he does is he looks back at the Old Testament and basically says, it's all been about this. And, and he does that by, he'll reference the, the historical writings, he'll quote from the prophets, he'll quote from the Psalms, and he'll quote from the law. Look at what he says. He says, as it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. That's from 2 Samuel. Paul is saying, you've read about it in the history of our people. This is the way it's always been, that the Gentiles would come in and sing to his name. And again, it is said, he quotes the law in Deuteronomy 32, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, he quotes the Psalm, Psalm 117, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, he quotes the prophets, Isaiah 11, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles hope. So Paul's saying, it's always been part of the plan. It's always been God's desire that his chosen people, the Jews, would be brought together with those who were outside of the promise and they would enjoy the benefits of his kingdom together. And so then Paul culminates this section, kind of erupts into another prayer over them. So may the God of hope, may the God of confident expectation fill you with all joy and peace in believing. In other words, through your faith, because you have faith in him, may he now fill you with his joy and his peace so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, there it is, we had the pattern of Jesus, the pardon of Jesus, welcome one another, and now the power of Jesus, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, you may abound in hope. You may abound in confident expectation. There's a lot in that text. It's not a very neat text, right? It doesn't kind of come together uh, neatly, but I'll do my best to just kind of share some observations. I told you I want to focus on the harmony that we live in and then the hope that we share in together. Uh, Kent Hughes says it like this, the quality of our unity, it either attracts or it repels the world. We know that, right? That our ability to live into a text like this, it either attracts the world to us or it causes the world to look at us and say, why in the world would I ever want to be a part of that people? I don't know about you, but oftentimes I shake my head, I, I, I scratch my head, I shake my head, I'm looking, I'm saying, I don't get how people become Christians today because the, the witness that we're giving as the people of God, usually it's not that appealing, is it? Right? There's so much infighting, so much frustrations with one another, so much backbiting and quarreling. It, it always amazes me that God is still able to draw people to himself in spite of the witness that we as the people of God give the world around us. And so as the people of God, we want to hear these words today and and receive the invitation, and if necessary, receive the rebuke, right? It may be that you are living this way today, that there isn't an issue of, of a lack of unity in your life, and that's wonderful, praise God. And so the hope for you today is that you'd keep going in that direction. And then there are others of you today. You are not unified with a brother or a sister. There may even be someone in this room today that you are arguing with, that you're frustrated with, that you find it hard to serve because maybe you think that they have, have uh, dishonored you or they have violated some part of your relationship. Well, today for you may be Jesus saying to you, come on, come on, recognize what I have done for you and live into this type of a life. Experience the harmony that we're called to live in. This isn't the first time Paul talks about harmony in Romans. He said it in Romans 12 verse six as well. In that section called The Marks of a True Christian, he says, live in harmony with one another. My friend Tim Hawks, he's a pastor in Texas, a friend of mine in Orlando, says this, the unity of the body is the missing apologetic that the world needs to see. Apologetic meaning an argument or a defense. And he says, the unity of God's people, God's people coming together, 
right? Not just Summit Church, but Summit Church being unified with all the other wonderful churches in our area. Churches that we may disagree on some things, but in the essentials we are unified. That what the world around us needs to see is the church of Jesus Christ coming together, living in harmony with one another, and that communicates the gospel to a watching, aching world, right? We already said today, we have an aching world. It's longing for a savior. So much pain in the world today. And imagine how God would wanna use his church, his people, to step into that pain as a unified body of believers to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Well, if that's what God wants for us, well, what's expected from us? I wanna answer a couple questions under this section. What's expected of us? What do we need? And what is the outcome? Well, what's expected of us is to do the hard work of pleasing our neighbors over ourselves. right? Please your neighbor over yourself. That's the pattern of Jesus. So when Jesus came, I wonder if any of us might be lulled into thinking that Jesus enjoyed receiving the reproach that we deserved. I wonder if any of us would ever view Jesus as loving the opportunity to be beaten and whipped for our sins and for our sake. No, Jesus came, remember in the garden, he's with the Lord, he says, God, if in any way you can allow this cup to pass for me, in other words, I don't want to do this, but if you want me to do it, I'll do it. If I have to do it, I'll do it. That's where Jesus found himself, laying down his life, choosing not his own pleasure, but the pleasure of those that he ultimately would bring into his family. I wonder for you today, what's it look like for you to please the people in your life, to consider them before you consider yourself? Philippians 2 says it this way, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, if anyone deserved to have other people serve his pleasure, it was Jesus. He was in the form of God, but yet he did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped. No, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Paul says to the strong, hey, you have an obligation. It's an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. It's an obligation to come alongside of your brother and sister and say, hey, even though I'm free to do this thing over here, I'm gonna lay it down because it's not about me being satisfied. I want to help you. I wanna build you up. And so what does that look like for you today? Is there a relationship that you need to do some work on? Is there a relationship where you need to go and ask for forgiveness? Hey, I'm so sorry. I fought for my own liberty in this relationship, and instead I should have been helping you and serving you. I'm not talking about going back to someone who is toxic or has abused you. I'm talking about going to a brother or a sister in Christ. It may be your spouse. It may be your kids. It may be someone in your community group. I'm talking about going to that person and saying, I am sorry. I have looked to please myself when all along I should have been looking to how to please you. So what's that look like for you today? What else is expected of us? Well, we're called to welcome one another. That's the pardon of Jesus. Just like Jesus has been gracious to you, be gracious to the people in your life. Uh, Tim Keller says it this way, for a person without a grasp of the gospel, so someone that doesn't get it, for a person without a grasp of the gospel, differences of opinion and practice are huge and insurmountable. But if we grasp justification, right, if we grasp the fact that Jesus took us, the guilty, and made us innocent, that he took our place, he took our punishment, if we get justification, he says, that we are accepted in spite of our deficiencies and flaws, well, then we will be enabled to accept others despite their deficiencies and flaws. In fact, the way you can tell how much you understand the gospel is to look at how much you love people despite their flaws. I wanna encourage you to do that today. Look at your own life and consider the people that you disagree with, the people that you have a difference of opinion with, the people maybe who have wronged you or harmed you that you're still called to live in harmony with. I want you to look at their, their life and look at their impact in your life 
And I want you to consider, okay, how do you view that person today? And I get it. This is asking you to do the most difficult thing in the world, to pardon someone who has hurt you, to forgive someone who has wronged you, to love someone that you disagree with. What does that look like for you this morning? Is there a conversation you need to have? And what I love is that Paul doesn't think this is easy. Right? He's not like, it's not like, hey, I'm telling you, this is like elementary stuff. No, he says, here's what you're going to need. So what do we need to do this? You're going to need endurance and you're going to need the encouragement of the scriptures, he says. You're going to need to see Jesus's endurance for you, the way he has endured. You're going to need to see it in the word of God, the way that he has always come through for his people the way that he has always honored a life that is laid down for the benefit of other people. You're gonna need endurance in your own life. You're gonna need perseverance and that perseverance, it comes from Jesus's perseverance for you. You're gonna need encouragement and so look to the past and see what God has done. And so we are invited to do the same. We're invited to look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our, uh, perfecter of our faith, Romans tells us who for the joy that was set before him, he ran the race and he endured. And he endured for you and he endured for me so that we could be encouraged, so that the gospel could produce endurance in us, so that the gospel could provide encouragement for us today. Ultimately, with the outcome of the glory of God being put on display. What's expected of us? We please others more than ourselves. We welcome one another the way Jesus welcomed us. We know it's hard, and so we look to Jesus and we, we receive his endurance and his encouragement. Ultimately, with the outcome of the glory of God being put on display. Look at verse six, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse seven, welcome one another for the glory of God. Look at verse uh, nine, in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, right? All of this that God is calling us into, this harmony that he's invited us into, it's all so that his glory would be on display. Second thing I want you to hear is this, the hope that we share in. The hope that we share in. Down there in verse 13, he says, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace and believing so that the, by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. So what's necessary in all of this? Like what is it that actually gets us access to this hope? Well, it's faith in Jesus and it's the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? He says all of this comes through your believing. The fact that you've put your trust in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter who you are, Jew or Gentile, rich or poor, black or white, old, young. It doesn't matter who you are. If you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, then you are unified with the people around you with a hope, a hope ultimately that will abound. And it abounds not by your own power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. I got to pray with a guy after the first service. He comes back, he's in tears. He says, this is the most difficult thing I've ever been asked to do. I've been wronged, and he has been wronged. If anyone should have the right to fight for himself, it's this guy. He's been wronged, but he recognizes that God is calling him in some way to live in unity or unified with another brother or a sister. And he knew he couldn't do it on his own. And so he came back, pray for me because all I feel is anger and rage. And I think about the things that I wanna do to this person. And I'm hearing it in my human ears and I'm saying, yes, 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 I get that. I get why you would wanna do those things. And there's no way that you can get through this without the power of the Holy Spirit. So we have access to this hope by our faith in Jesus, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, what is it that he's gonna produce in us? Joy and peace there, he says, right? Do you remember the text that we looked at last week? The main verse we pulled out was Romans 14, verse 17. He says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and or drinking, right? So he's saying, it's not about what you do. It's not about what you say yes or no to. No, it's about the righteousness of God being developed in your life. His righteousness, his peace and joy 
in the Holy Spirit. And here's Paul again saying, this is what it looks like to live in the kingdom. This is the beauty of a life in the kingdom of God. God's people abounding in hope, filled with his joy. Not happiness over all circumstances, but an inner joy, a confidence that God is still good and God loves you no matter what's going on. Joy and peace, no matter how rocky the, the sea is or how, wa- how big the waves are, recognizing that there is a peace that Jesus gives us that's unlike the peace of the world. Ultimately, the outcome of this hope is that the beauty of life in his kingdom would be seen by a watching world. Right? That God's unified people living in harmony with one another, laying down their own rights, being willing to serve their brother or sister, that the world would see us welcoming one another the way that Jesus has welcomed us, that the world would see us enduring and encouraged by the scripture, putting God's glory on display, having faith in Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, experiencing his joy, his peace, and all of that pours out unto the world around us that we abound in hope. The band can come on up. What does this look like for you today? To just remember the fact that you've been called into this. I mean, how good is this hope that we get to share in? It's not a hope that's just for us. It's a hope as individuals. It's a hope for us collectively, right? It's a hope that we've been called into. No matter what walk of life we come from, no matter what our history is, no matter what our experience is, whether we trusted Christ as a little kid or you trusted Christ this week, we all get to sit at the same table, unified as one, putting the glory of God in display, experiencing his joy, his peace, his hope. Hear now these words from Paul, but through the message translation, a paraphrase. I wanna read these two verses or these two prayers over you in closing. I just love the way it says it. So may our dependably steady and warmly personal God Develop maturity in you so that you get along with each other as well as Jesus gets along with us all. Then we will be a choir, not our voices only, but our very lives singing in harmony and a stunning anthem to the God and Father of our Master Jesus. Oh, may the God of green hope fill you up with joy and fill you up with peace so that your believing lives filled with the life-giving energy of the Holy Spirit will brim over with hope. Isn't that what God wants? There's a harmony we get to live in, a hope we get to share in. And all of it is so that his glory would be put on display. And so that life in his kingdom would be seen by a watching, aching, longing world. I told you on that last night that Jesus was with his brothers, his friends, the disciples around the table. Of utmost importance to him was their unity. And so their unity was on his mind when he took the bread and when he raised the cup. He took that bread on that night and he broke it. He broke it in anticipation that his body would be broken so that his people could be whole. He took that bread and he passed it to his brothers around the table and he said, this is my body. As often as you eat it, eat it in remembrance of me. And so we take the wafer and we eat in remembrance of him. In the same way, he took the cup and he passed it to each and every one of them. He said, this is the blood of my new covenant. As often as you drink it, I want you to drink it in remembrance of me. Drink it in remembrance of the one who has brought you together as the people of God. So Father, we love you. Father, we thank you for all that you've done. God, we ask that you would put the unity of your people on display so that a watching, aching, longing world could see the glory of God and see the beauty of life in his kingdom. God, thank you for this hope that we get to share in, the joy and the peace that fill our lives as a result of it. God, we thank you for the harmony we get to live in, that we get to link arms with one another, that we're not here left alone, but instead we're part of a family. God, a messy family, a family that's trying our best, but a family... Nonetheless, 
So God, I ask that you'd remind us of that vision of what that looks like to live into that harmony today. God, if there's anyone that we need to go to today and ask for forgiveness or anyone that we need to serve today, would you show us and then give us the courage and faith to do it? God, if there's ways that we've been harmed and hurt that we find ourselves today feeling vulnerable and afraid, God, I ask that you'd meet us in that place, that you would mend our broken hearts, that you'd heal us. God, that you'd show us what life in the kingdom is really all about. God, if there's any in here who haven't trusted in you, I ask that today would be the day. God, as they hear this grand vision of the people of God, that they would say, I want in on that. So God, give them the courage to just confess to you. I I, I need you. I want you. Please, would you forgive me of my sins? God, we love you. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. Why don't you stand with us now, church? We'll finish in worship.